One, two, three, go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third series of the University of Ghana School of Law Zoom Legal Seminars, Dubbed Law in Crisis. My name is Shamima Muslim, and I will be moderating with your kind cooperation, of course. Today's topic is on policing and the COVID-19. We ask, is the police struggling, coping, or somewhere in between? And what precisely are they struggling with, coping with, or somewhere in between with? We will also explore whether Ghana's modern policing model, if we have any at all, is providing the right responses to the matters arising out of the COVID pandemic. The previous sessions explored elections and the EC in the pandemic, as we have it, as well as the enhanced executive powers and the implications for um, constitutionalism and uh, personal liberties. The videos are online on YouTube and Facebook. You can apprise yourself later. Today, though, we are on the police, Abang, as we popularly call them. The session will be streamed live on Facebook and YouTube as well. So tell a friend, tell a friend to join us. I will go immediately to introduce the panel that we have um, for today's conversation. Very big panel, very exciting um, names. Shortly you would hear them and definitely you would enjoy the conversation. We have um, Professor Kwesi Enim, Director Faculty of Academic Affairs and research at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. Dr. Uh, Professor Enning, if you can hear me, can you give a wave and say hi to our participants? Well, hi, it's a great opportunity to share some ideas. Great. We also have Dr. Sena Akwa Day Tutu, who is a lecturer at the University of Ghana School of Law. Doc, hello. Great. And we have also all the way from the UK, um, Emmanuel Sowate. He's a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge and a former senior peace and development advisor at UNDP Nigeria. Dr. Sowate, welcome. Yeah, merci beaucoup. Thank uh -huh. you. Good to see you. Also, we have Nana Kofi Kwachi, who is also a PhD candidate at the New York University College of Global Health. Welcome, Nana Kofi. Thank you for having me and glad to share this panel with everybody else here. Okay, so we are expecting to be joined by um, COP Kofi Kwachi and um, Superintendent of Police, Ms. Sheila Kesie Abeye Bachman who is Director of Public Affairs at the Ghana Police Service. So of course, we cannot have a police conversation without representation from them. So we are working, they'll be joining us hopefully very shortly. So that is it by way of our panel members. And we thank you all for making time to join. So straight ahead, we are starting the conversation. And um, if you're joining us, it is the third in the series of the University of Ghana's um, seminar series online. COVID is turning almost all of us into tech freaks. The laggards like some of us who didn't, um, weren't so much involved in tech, we're not having to use opportunities available to us. So round one, we are going to have a three round of questions and then one round of questioning from you, the participants. So we're starting straight ahead with our first round. It's a very fast paced round. The Ghana Police Service since its establishment in the 1930s by what I call our colonial tyrants, 
has had a checkered history with widespread perceptions of corruption, unprofessionalism, amidst complaints of poor training, logistics, and remuneration. Pandemics and other emergency situations are always watershed moments that bring into sharp focus the capacity of the police institution to rise up to the challenge. So my first question requires a yes or no answer from my panel members. The question is, is the Ghana police struggling, coping, or somewhere in between? And with what exactly are they struggling with, coping with, or in between with regarding the COVID pandemic? I'll start with you, um, Professor Kwesi Eni. Well, thank you very, thank you very much. Um, and I think this is a really very great question. For me, it's somewhere in between, you know, but I think we need to take into consideration the history of the Ghana Police Service, the types of training they've been provided with, the operational intent and their skill sets, their logistics capabilities, and more importantly, the novel nature of the assignment that they have been given with. Um, in taking into consideration all these challenges, but most importantly, the number nature of the assignment, my argument is that they have performed much better than we could have ex ex expected. Two things more. Let's not forget that the police service itself and its personnel are also facing the same kind of challenges. Mm -hmm. No police service on earth has had to face this pandemic. Furthermore, is that the thinking, the psychological preparation, the duties that the government gave to the Ghana police mm -hmm. service came out of the blue mm -hmm. and in securitizing the virus, right. okay, the narratives that accompanied the secretization of the virus that brought the police service onto our streets in, a, in much larger numbers, were such that they themselves had to, on the spare of the moment, respond to the challenges that they face. So they are providing normal policing or law enforcement services. They've become educators and they are providing humanitarian assistance all rolled into one towards a population that is recalcitrant, that doesn't believe that this unseen enemy is existent, who believes sometimes that swimming in the sea is what happens. And if we go back to the history, that then limits the capacity and then the willingness of the service and its personnel sometimes actually to act because we are never too sure Right. who is going to report to you and how the response is going to be mm. from the capital city. So taking all this into consideration, I think they perform yes, very creditably. I will, give them a, I, will, I, I will give them a very strong B. And I'm sure that um, Superintendent uh, Sheila Abaye will be very happy to hear that from uh, Professor Ending, who is one of the critical minds and who criticizes the police institution has done a lot of work on the police service. And um, by that, I would welcome you to the program. Um, Sheila Abaye, welcome to the Thank program. Thank you. Yeah, hello. And do we have Commissioner on as well, Kofi Wachi? Yeah, yes. Okay, so COP, good afternoon to you. It's an honor to have you. Right, so we're moving on now. Dr. Sena, so um, Professor Kosianin is saying that um, the, the police service is somewhere in between because no police force has been trained to fight an invisible enemy like uh, the COVID. So what's your take? Struggling, coping in between? Um, I would say that on the outside, they seem to be coping and doing quite an excellent job at it, you know. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt, like, you know, Professor Enin said, this is something that nobody in the world has faced before. And from what we are seeing our police do, they seem to be doing an excellent job. And they've not been trained for this. 
when you go to the police academy or wherever it is that you're trained to be a policeman, you are trained to enforce the law, maintain law and order. But in this case, you're fighting something that you cannot see. Right. And not only that, you're dealing with a public that believes or doesn't believe that what they're fighting, what you say you're fighting is there. Mm -hmm. So the police have to deal with the public that believes or doesn't believe that the virus is there. The police also have to think about themselves because this is an enemy that can attack both them and the public as well. So from the videos and the conversations we've seen around, I mean, if we compare the Ghana police to lots of the police um, we've seen, we see, they're doing an excellent job because you meet a bunch of recal recalcitrant people who are stubborn, but we've seen that our police increasingly are not using unnecessary force, at least of course there are cases where they have, but generally we see them engaging more with the public, talking to them and getting results that, you know, otherwise they wouldn't get. So I'd say, yes, they're coping on the surface, but without a doubt, I'm sure they're struggling, but they put their best foot forward. So we're seeing the good part of what they're doing. So yes, I'll say that. So they're yeah. coping, but a little bit of a struggle in there. And we'll be getting yeah. into that deeper, right? So let me come to Sheila um, Kesia Bayie Bachman, Director of Public Affairs, Ghana Police Service. Are you struggling? Are you coping? Or oh, you're yeah, somewhere in between? What would you say? Shamima and to all the panelists and even to participants, we are still on top of crime. We are still on top of law and order and generally ensuring that residents of our communities are safe and can go about their normal business without let on hindrance. And in addition to this, which is our traditional role, we have now had to take on the new role of COVID enforcement of restrictions, including heavy border patrols, security at quarantine centers, escorts for contact tracing, and even keeping convicts who are supposed to be in prison where there were no such previous structures. And that is what the Ghana Police Service is doing. So like all others have said, we are doing very well in managing law enforcement amidst COVID. That is what we are doing. Okay, so in the next one, we'll be asking, we'll be put interrogating that position. And um, we will move on now to the next person, um, next panel member, and that will be uh, Mr. Emmanuel Sowate. What is your take? Yeah, thank you for having me again. You see, um, it depends on how you conceive of the primary role of the police. Um, right. You can see the police as law enforcement or as some have argued, social peacekeeping agency or, or other maintenance. If you see the police only as law enforcement, you limit the range of activities that police usually engage in. So for example, let me just run through some of the things police do that are not necessarily law enforcement as right. directly conceived. So broader um, areas beyond Ghana, what I mean is that beyond Ghana, Police services have variations, but they also have certain commonalities. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in certain places, you see the police intervening in family crisis, searching for lost children, rescuing animals, directing traffic, supervising um, crowd, visiting schools, assisting the elderly, um, and, and the list goes on. Right. And actually, if you look at what the police um, do, or that, depending on whether you see them as a group or um, subgroups, what you realize is that the enforcement part, enforcement of the law is usually about 20% or 30% of what they actually do. Most of the things they do do not necessarily mean that they are enforcing the law, but they are trying to maintain order. They are trying to do what you call social peacekeeping. So if you have the broader view of seeing police as playing a social peacekeeping role, where law enforcement is just one, because you need three things. You need discretion, you need institution, you need individuals. There are four types of discretion. There are discretions around scope, there are discretions around priority, there are discretions around interpretations, and then there are discretions at the tactical level. Mm -hmm. So it depends on how you are looking at the police. If you want to see them as enforcement- so how are you looking at it in this then, matter of the pandemic? How are you looking at it? And social in the lens that you see them, are social they coping or social struggling? Peacekeeping. Social peacekeeping. And I think that given the social peacekeeping, 
Um, so far, they are doing well. So they are coping? Yes, I think they are coping. And let me explain that again. Mm -hmm. What you see the police doing is a potpourri of issues that they have just been drafted into the front line to deal with. Mm -hmm. So some of the issues they'll be dealing with might be mental health related, might be issues of stress and screen, might be issues of um, lack of understanding. And what you see the police doing, um, repeating myself, is just playing a role that so many actors will do. In other words, the, the, the success of failure of the police is contingent on other facilitating actors and conditions. Great. Let me take Nana Kofi Kwache's um, position on the matter. What would be your thesis, Nana? Well, good afternoon. Thanks for having me and thanks for everybody tuning in. Um, my view on this naturally is situated in public health because that's my expertise. And I look at this within the context of what the public health imperatives are. At the very heart of those is a question of respect for persons and you know, acknowledgement of human dignity. And around that is what we are, we are structuring a, like Dr. Eni said, a securitized response um, to managing the, the pandemic. And within that context, given the novelty of the situation and given the challenges with actually having sufficiently time to prepare, I would say that the Ghana Police Service generally is coping. But there are certain things that are worth considering. Fundamentally, again, that despite the securitization, we are still fundamentally dealing with a public health emergency, a right. medical emergency um, specifically. And therefore, in responding to those things, there are certain aspects of respect for persons, right to privacy, and acknowledgement of dignity, like I said, that um, in some cases have been, have been somewhat lacking. But again, I, I attribute some of those things, yes, to, in some cases, operational challenges and operational failures, but in other cases, uh, more specifically to the, the dichotomy of the function of the police service as a law enforcement agency and the demand for the crisis in terms of as a body that's going to, to monitor and institute social interventions to make sure that we can curb the spread, where they're, they're really, in effect, performing a public health advisory and regulatory role. Um, in, in some senses. So in terms of the, the operational failures, I think it's fair to say that there have been a few cases and a few instances. And I think with, when it comes to the actual operationalization of that public health enforcement role, um, there are still some challenges that have to do with the novelty of the situation. Right, and we'll be going to those challenges pretty shortly. But now let's wrap up this session by inviting Commissioner um, Kofi Bwachi, who is the Commissioner of Police in charge of research planning and monitoring and evaluation. COP, what will be your conclusion and your thesis on the question of uh, whether or not the police is coping, struggling, or somewhere in between with this um, pandemic? Um, thank you very much. First and foremost, I'd like to say here and now that I take exception to your- COP, your mic is a bit low. I say I take exception to your introduction. Because you went along saying that the police is known to be corrupt, unprofessional, which is the no. old traditional narrative, which you could have done better than going back to that and force the discussion in the context of this pandemic. Having said that, mm -hmm. I think, um, and also the question as to whether we are struggling, coping, or in between. Why didn't you add we are doing well? So you are not doing well. We, or not doing well. If you are so, coping, I am not doing well. We are doing very, very well. But first and foremost, you must now accept the fact that this is something that nobody in the world prepared for it. Right. And the police, we are negotiating between more or less four others. One is how to prevent crime within this pandemic. Two, how to enforce the law within and maintain order within this pandemic. Three, how to protect the policemen themselves from getting infected because they are also human beings. And four, how to uphold human rights. Mm -hmm. And we must do all these things at the same time. Mm -hmm. First, we all know that this is an uncharted territory. There is no precedent and it's yeah. an evolving and dynamic situation and that is globally uh, affected. So if you consider all these 
variables, mm -hmm. then you can say that the police service is doing very, very well. So you don't need any help? Who told you that if you are doing well, you don't need help? I'm asking. There is something, apart from doing very well, there's excellent too. There's what? Excellence. Uh-huh. So, so, so you are still you are still yet to reach the excellent that level. Is the point. Okay, so in the next one, you tell us what you need to reach this excellence level. Is that a deal? I'm sorry, ma. Great. So that's how we wrap up our first round where people have answered yes or no to whether they think the police is struggling, um, coping, or somewhere in between. But COP would have us also put in there they are doing well. So are they doing well? If you're listening to us or watching us, send us your comments uh, via YouTube, Facebook, and we're live on Zoom as well. So moving straight ahead to our second round. So there's always been some tension, and I'm happy COP referred to it, the issue about upholding human rights. There's always been some tension between the police and citizens, right? And even human rights activists over police conduct in the exercise of their law enforcement and public order duties is the problem with overzealous police individuals within the service is the problem with the training or is it plain stubborn citizens who create these situations let us watch these videos and return shortly to take the response from our panel members Shortly, we'll be watching some two videos to introduce our next um, set of questions. But if the videos are not ready, should I just start? And when the videos um, are ready, we would, we would continue with that. So the next question to our panel members is, um, does Ghana have a modern policing model? I'll start with you, um, Commissioner of Police here on that matter? Um, it depends on how you define model. Mm -hmm. Because um, we are really going digital in all our operations. And to, to, to put it mildly, modernization means technology. And technology is dynamic. So at this point in time, we cannot say that we are fully modernized, but like our transformation objectives clearly says, we are dri dri driving to achieve that kind of modernization where a time may come that all our systems will be digitized. And until we reach that stage, we cannot say that we are fully modernized. Beyond, beyond um, digitization, what other elements do you reckon the police requires is that you know that police service all over the world is mechanistic and highly bureaucratic because of the ranking system so right. now we need to move from that kind of highly structured organization and the bureaucratic structure to more or less um, organistic structure which means that we must do more away with the um, uh, uh, ranking system and come back to what is known as the humanistic kind of organization. And mm -hmm. until we come to that stage, we cannot say that we have arrived fully at that kind of modernization. How long will it take us to arrive at that kind of modernization? You know, we have a transformation program, mm -hmm. which deals with um, being accountable, being transparent, mm -hmm. and also improve the civil police relationship mm -hmm. and see the civilians as part and parcel of of our operations mm -hmm. until we are able to um, achieve that kind of cooperation from the civilians where mm -hmm. the civilian will have that kind of sense of ownership and belongingness then we cannot say that we have achieved that because um, security is a shared responsibility right and we need to reach out to the pub public so that they will not see us 
as bullies. They should not see us as people who abuse their rights. And mm -hmm. also, they will see the police system as part of their own system. And that is quite uh, a brilliant task in the midst of all that. So talking about the traditional law enforcement um, process, the way that you have enforced laws so far within this same highly structured organization, do you think that um, it poses, uh, the, 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 the pandemic poses new realities to this traditional law enforcement mechanism? Yes, because now the new paradigm is to engage the public explain to the public, encourage them before we enforce the law. Right. And that is quite a dilemma. How do we now move from what we are used to, giving directions and giving instructions, to now yeah. engage them to solicit their views and to, uh, account for our own behavior, and mm -hmm. also explain our behavior to them, and also become more transparent in our operations. Right. If we are able to do that, and also encourage them to accept us as part and parcel of the society. You see, and that is quite a dilemma because how do you encourage somebody you want to arrest? How do you encourage somebody who has committed an offense? And mm -hmm. with the dilemma, we must negotiate to arrive at the modernity that we all ascribe. Let me bring um, Sana in at this moment. Do you think that this dilemma is surmountable any time soon in the foreseeable future? Oh, yes, I think so. I mean, mm. well, perhaps I'm an optimist, but I, I think that everything is possible. Thing mm. is, um, when we talk about modern policing methods, mm -hmm. I'd say that to a large extent, our police is moving there, but we're not there yet. Because the police traditionally has been about brawn and force. If you look at the history of the Ghana police, the police was set up to support the colonial, you know, ruling class. And initially, you didn't need, you know, much of an education. Even up to today, if you look at the requirements to get into the police force, for men, you have to be a certain height. And for women, too, you shouldn't be below a certain height. But increasingly, we are seeing that crime is not just about running after people to kill them. Crime is getting more and more technological. So perhaps even in terms of recruitment, I could be four, four feet two, but be an excellent computer hacker, you know? So then I should be able to get into the police so that when it comes to issues of hacking and all that, by virtue of my brilliance as a computer programmer, or whatever, I'd assist the police in arresting whoever is committing that crime that you know, digital crime. But I also think that community policing is a big thing. When we talk about security sector reform now, it's more about human security than say the security of the state without the citizen. And for people to feel safe, like um, COP was saying, the police have to be a part of where, who the people are. So perhaps we should be moving our police more from the, you know, behind the desk at the police station to be a part of where the, um, the police and the community, they interact with the people, they interact with the leaders of the community so that if something is happening, you know, and this system of policing will be excellent now because now you're dealing with the minds of the people, trying to convince them to know that we need to work with you so that we get results. He talked about the fact, the fact of encouraging, enforcing, and you know, negotiating the people before finally enforcing the crimes. You know, I'm sorry, the punishment, right? So I'd say that perhaps what the police should be looking at now is getting more and more into the communities, working with the people who are on the ground. So that typical example in Oboasi a few days ago, they wanted to cite, uh, uh, what do they call that? Uh, isolation center and the people were upset and yeah. you know, practically rioting. Mm -hmm. To get the police, to get them to see where you know, the health authorities are going with this, then you need for them to engage with the people, talk to them, let them, you know, let them understand that this is for your own good, know the benefits and all that. And then, you know, we may not have a situation like that. So for me, I think that 
modern policing to some extent is in Ghana, but we could get better without a doubt. And there are little, little things that can be done to ensure that what we call or what people call modern policing is you know, realized in the country. Mm. So um, definitely we'll come back to you on whether you think in terms of training and you know the mindset shift. And we all know that behavioral change is one of the most difficult things to achieve. And sometimes it isn't because people don't know, they perhaps do not care. And in, in, in the case of this pandemic, what has um, come out is the fact that, you know, people fear hunger more than they fear, you know, the, the death. Wouldn't you say? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, they, they'll tell you that if you protect me and I die, then what's the point? You know, and I, I, I saw a video today in one of the states in America, is it Mississippi? No, Mississippi, one of them. But this, this barber who has opened his barbering shop and right. says that, yeah, despite what's going on, he's, he has to work to earn some money because he's looked for jobs, he can't get anything, and he's going to die hungry. And that's the same situation we have here because if you keep me safe in a room and I die of hunger, then what's the point? Let me go out. I may or may not catch the disease. That's a risk I'm prepared to take because I have my family to feed. I have to look after myself. And it's, it's human nature because why keep me in a room locked up when I can die of hunger? No, let me go out. If I get it, great. There's some hospital that will look after me if I die. I'll die anyway from my room, isn't it? So, well, let me take the risk and go out and look for something to do. Very well. Uh, Mr. Soate, as a criminologist, what would be your take um, on, on, the, on this matter of whether or not you know, traditional law enforcement will work with the new realities that COVID is posing to us? Um, the nexus between human rights and the stubborn citizen and how a well-trained or not well-trained police should respond to this escalate potential uh, problematic situations? Well, this is not a double or quadruple barrel question. Ah. I think it's more than that. Thank you for uh, many words. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll try and answer. Um, mm -hmm. Starting from um, the theory, the, the strain theory, because in the argument that I'm hearing so far, one core criminological theory is called the strain theory, where when people go under a certain degree of stress, and strain, they might resort to what you might see as, as rule breaking. Um, and I think that what is imagining, repeating myself, if the extent to which the pandemic, if it, the pandemic itself is not affecting crime or how crime and violence are shaping, um, it is the measures, largely the measures that the governments are putting in place. And almost without exception, when you have a radical and a sudden change in routine life, daily lives. You have a corresponding shift um, in that response in crime and violence. And that will in turn have an effect on how the police will respond. And I want to go back to where I started from, that if we see policing in the narrow sense of law enforcement, we are missing the interconnectivity of issues that you might see as police, but actually a product of so many other factors. So for example, you might see somebody on the street holding cutlass, well-dressed, strengthening people. The police might be called. But yes, although the police would be there, the underlying causes and the response might be born out of something else, which is something like a, maybe a, a, a mental issue or, or a psychiatric issue or a psychological issue. Now to your question, um, how are the police um, dealing with this? I think that for me, I want to go back to something Commissioner said in terms of modernization model. There are right. two ways you can go about it, it referring to state response, particularly the police. Either you want to go by the authoritarian type of policing, or you go by policing that people see to be more associated with liberal democratic ethos. And once you go towards the liberal democratic ethos, you are touching one fundamental issue of criminology. Why do people obey the law? And tied to that is voluntary compliance. Voluntary right. compliance is very key. And when you talk about voluntary compliance, you are talking about the normative part of individual societies and communities. And I think that when you think that all the laws in Ghana can be enforced, one, it cannot because of numbers. Two, mm -hmm. if police will enforce all the laws, wouldn't get places to keep people. 
And so let's also try to tilt the discussion a little towards voluntary compliance and the role that other actors can play to make sure that when it comes to actually enforcing the law, and Kofi Pachi talked about, Commissioner talked about the three E's. I actually know the police commissioner, Peter Neroy, who brought that three E's because he's in my faculty, Institute of Criminology, Cambridge. And the first idea behind the engagement is to make sure that at least you engage in terms of having a discussion, a discussion born out of dignity and respect. You right. give the other person an audience, what you call the teaching moment in criminology. Now, when you do that, you are trying to build a rapport and make sure that the person will comply before you come to the enforcement. The second one after the engagement is how do you explain? And that is where Senna said something, and Professor Eni also talked about it, that you have a police officer who has to, on the feet, think about explaining uh, issues around maybe why your religious belief is good, but then there are other ways of dealing with the problem. You might be dealing with somebody who is stressed, he or she doesn't have a job, is coming right. from home angry, you have to calm down the person, and the police will have to do all this at the same time. So after the explanation, you try to encourage the person that because of, for example, the consequence of this virus on the individual, on community, on the nation, in terms of what? The health, the economics, and um, rolling back our, our benefits as a country, please, to an animal, we take this step. And then if the person doesn't, you enforce. The enforcement, depending on the country you find yourself, might range from fine or physical arrest. And that is where the danger of the police officer comes in. But I think that generally across the world, uh, the idea is more of making sure that the, the arrest should be the last resort. Because mm, you don't want to... Um, yeah, to voluntary compliance, voluntary compliance is, is, right. is very important. But how do you deal with a, a citizen like the young man who was interviewed on television who said, oh, he came out and the security agency asked him what he was going to do and he said he was going to buy some medicines and so the reporter asked him, but was that true? He said, no, it was not actually true. He just wanted to come and see how citizens were complying. This, this is the reality of the, 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 the Ghanaian, is it yes, not? Um, um, just a quick one on that. When it comes to predictors of, predictors of deviance in criminology, um, mm -hmm. males around the ages of 18 to 22 um, have gained notoriety for rule breaking for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. And to the constituencies that would conform or break the rules, and um, speaking as a criminologist, um, sometimes can be predicted, depending on the context. Context is defined to mean the socio-economic political um, context. The last thing um, in terms of voluntary compliance, before I keep quiet, also has to do with the relationship between the citizens, different constituencies is true, the mm -hmm. citizens and the states. And that is where in criminology we call something audience legitimacy, power holder legitimacy. And I think that if you look at the extent to which the history that the citizen-state relationship um, produces, and um, sometimes would it help you understand how people would either break rules, conform with rules, or depending on the context, try to combine both. But you always have rule breakers. Right. So, Professor Kwesi Hello, Prof. Yes, Professor Kwesi Nini, Hello. Hello. Yes, yeah, so I mean, you you have you have said that um, especially this uh, period has seen citizens seemingly, you know, warming up to the police more than they are even doing with the political or elite class. What, why that nuance? Well, let me start by explaining this. I think Nana Kofi made a very good point that this is a medical crisis. Mm -hmm the medical crisis is beginning to shift into an economic, a social, and a political crisis. Right. The legacies of COVID-19 is that the efficacy and the very survival of the state will be at stake, okay? Now, when we see citizens behave the way they do, okay, it's because they don't see the state in their lives and they perceive any behavior that allows them to strike a blow at the state and its elite leaders as almost legitimate. Now that places the police service and its personnel under immense stress. 
So while the police have performed creditably until now and have managed to respond as a humanitarian institution, as an educator institution, we will begin to see shifts. Now, this is a numbers game. Ghana as a state has failed since 1960 to correlate police numbers to population growth. Yeah. So that right now, Commissioner Kofi Bwache and Superintendent Sheila are probably having just about what? About uh, 33, 34,000 men, different types of vehicles, a lot of them not fit for purpose, and a service that internally, because of undue meddling, is also unhappy. Okay. So, I think uh, Suwati says something that is very Do key. political meddling, uh, meddling you mean? Oh, as for that one, it's historical. Mm -hmm. Okay, that leads to all sorts of structural challenges and difficulties. So, what we should be looking at relates to issues of hybridity. But let me leave the hybridity bit and then talk about society's response mm -hmm. to the police and the way that the service itself perceives the challenges that they are facing. First, I've spoken about the fact that it perceives itself as a humanitarian mm -hmm. institution in responding to the needs of those who need food. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Dampare has been very clear and has warned his own people in terms of how they should let convoys with vehicles pass through during the lockdown. Okay, now this is a service in which we are seeing its leadership showing Hello. Hello, Prof. I think we're having your Clear next signals. Because right. they're almost about five. Yes. Is it better now? Yes, I can hear you now. Good. You ought to have given us credit, actually, because this is being paid out of, of our pockets. No, I am worrying, actually, if I have to be very we'll give, we'll honest. Give. So we see the police responding in a manner that is innovative and useful. We've seen COP Kofi Bwache himself sending signals warning the public to follow the law. Otherwise, he will be forced to use the law to respond. But we've seen a narrative and a discourse from the police service itself mm -hmm. presenting and couching their responses to COVID-19 broadly as a joint effort and joint action. The narrative and the rhetoric about community policing has been enhanced because of the COVID. The police service, unlike other institutions, have noticed that when you securitize something and you bring police officers as the key focal institution that relates to and confronts the public, that their behavior can shift the enemy from the virus mm -hmm. to the service itself. Mm -hmm. And this is where the educator, humanitarian, joint action, joint effort, narrative from the police service itself is very important. But Dr. Gariba, for example, has argued quite eloquently that we will not intimidate people and we will not let our people intimidate others. Mm. Have there been some mistakes, weaknesses along the way? Certainly. I mean, it's a human institution. Um, and then, as you said earlier on, in my younger days, uh, the police service was one of my uh, target institutions, but as you grow old, you learn to moderate mm. your, your uh, narrative. Mm. So we are seeing an improved response relationship be between the police and the public. What does this mean? Mm. What it means is that institutions do matter. Right. And that resilient institutions, even when they are faced with challenges that they have not been trained for, are able to adapt and shift focus. 
And, let, and, and he realized the point that Soate has made about domestic peacekeeping. We are seeing a cognitive process in which some of the hostility, the abuse that the service has faced in doing international peacekeeping mm -hmm. is being brought to bear on what Soate terms as domestic or peacekeeping, right? So, yeah. So, there are lots of lessons that we can learn. Okay. There are still challenges. The logistics are a problem. For those of us who train, we need to go back to the drawing board and say, how do we generate new knowledge and pass them on in a pedagogical manner to police officers and their men on the front line who would need to respond? Two quick points. Mm -hmm. One, is that in doing all this, COP Kofi Bwachi spoke about the, the digitization, okay? First, we digitize. Mm -hmm. The human face of policing is important. And this is where the numbers game comes in. As a nation, we have failed consistently to invest in, in the Ghana Police Service. COP Kofi Bwachi talks about their, their transformation plan. Yeah. That was a $180 million um, uh, uh, transformation plan of which less than 10% of that money has been given to the police service, okay? If over time we do a time series analysis of how much money the police service requests from the government of Ghana and how much is actually given, more often than not, less than 15 to 20%, of what is requested for is what gets to the Ghana Police Service. So this is an institution under immense constraints in terms, in all senses, okay? So how do we get a service to deliver on its core mandate of protecting lives, property, and then if we throw in what uh, Soate and Senna have said? Right. Because we don't have enough people, and the recruitment will never be able to fulfill the expectations of the public and in our contentious partisan political space not be misconstrued, we need improved hybrid forms of security, justice, and peace provision. Okay? In this conversation, we've heard people talk about the need to look and broaden those who can support the uh, uh, police. Right. We haven't spent much time on it, but probably post-COVID, it might be necessary to say what are the institutional structures, both traditional and modern, who collab collaboratively can be provided with some skill sets to help the police. We are seeing it in Mali, in Niger, and in uh, Burkina Faso. Laws have been passed to say, look, we recognize our financial and logistical and human resource constraints. The nature of the threat is changing. We need intelligence from the ground up and from the, and from the top down. And I think uh, different institutions can help. That is based on trust, respect, and reciprocity. Right. I am Great. optimistic that it can and must be done. So, I mean, the next question would be uh, beyond the pandemic, how do we sustain this new ground that seems to be you know, imagine between police-civilian relationships. So we would we would uh, tackle that towards the end of the program. Now, Kofi, I mean, from the public health point of view, how do we strike a balance between personal liberties and the public good? And how do we get citizens to, you know, actually voluntarily obey the rules and regulations? Thanks for the question. So when it comes to finding this balance, um, like, like Mr. Sowate said, part of the challenge here is with voluntary compliance and what underlies that really? Um, that's not a question necessarily of the efficacy of your enforcement. It's a question of people's risk understanding, risk perception and ability to comply. So that has to do with broader contextual factors um, into which the police service enforcement role um, um, is, 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 is important. But when it comes to understanding what that balance should be, again, like I said, in public health, we situate this conversation around respect for, for, for persons, human dignity, 
um, and, and individual liberty almost as the, as the short run you know, priority. But in this particular instance that we are dealing with here, we're looking at a global pandemic. We're dealing with a situation where we have a novel, novel you know, virus that is very transmissible, highly infectious. And even though individual risks might not necessarily be high, the aggregate consequences are pretty severe. And the aggregate consequences, not just economic, not just health-wise, but economic, um, legal, and all the other things are also a, 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 a big factor here. In striking that balance, I think it's important that the police service be given the necessary support to actually do that, and that the broader you know, legal framework um, allows them to, to do that role effectively. Because if we have a situation in which their role is to enforce, um, you know, you know, basically enforce the social distancing or, um, and as we had before, lockdown measures, you know, by you know arrests and and more more coercive means, and it's not, you know, prefaced by some amount of investment in making sure that the health education effort and the public health awareness effort has really gone down. Then you are setting them up. For, for failure. And like Dr. Anin said, it creates a situation where the, the attention or the, the, the focus of the, of the public, um, you know, ire shifts from the virus itself to the people who are enforcing the regulations that are going to help them. So it's important that, you know, all the support institutions and in, in health education, information, um, and in health delivery all also do what they need to do to make it so that the voluntary compliance can be somewhat attained. But in finding the balance there of, of where the rights are, obviously, this is a situation where we have to understand that the public good, because of the aggregate risk, also must be really um, well considered and well thought out. And in thinking through that, there are, there are certain types of, of individual expectations that reasonably will be infringed upon um, in certain instances, um, where we might have mandatory quarantines, mandatory isolation based on assessments of people's ability to comply. Those are things that are necessary to attain the public health objectives here. But in pursuing those public health objectives, there are certain types of, of rights that we have to be very careful not to, not, not, not to infringe upon. And that's where I think the question of training and preparedness of the police force comes in. Um, I'll use an example of an article that came out um, last week. I believe City News published it, where they referred to, where they described a situation where somebody who was, an, was an, at an isolation center, um, a positive case, had left the isolation center um, and had been, on the, had been you know, circulating in the town for, in a township for a while. We've had other cases for, of, of this, but what stuck out to me in this particular instance was that when law enforcement finally identified the person, arrested the person, the way that it treated that situation with the media was as it would with a criminal suspect where the name of the person was released, the isolation center of the person was, that was released. And in this context, those are actually specifically medical records. And the right to privacy around those, you know, ought, ought, ought to be, those, that's not something that ought to be um, infringed upon. So even as we, as we accept that there are reasonable limitations um, to certain liberties in the context of being able to, uh, to, to meet the broader public health imperatives, it is critical that we are clear on the ones which should not be compromised, right to privacy being one of those, right to dignity being one of those. Um, and to make sure that that doesn't happen, that cannot be left up to the discretion of individual police officers who are also still managing an evolving situation under great duress. That is something that should be delineated in more explicit terms so that they can understand that if you, if you encounter a, a, an individual in these circumstances, given the fact that Yes, these certain rights are, are, are open for discourse. These ones are not, and this is the way that you should approach it with some operational guidelines. I think that would really help um, in, in keeping things in order. How, how about the risk exposure of the police um, themselves? And other panelists have alluded to it. How do they also enforce their rights to be protected against contracting the disease in, 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 in pursuit of, of their objects? Of course, I mean, th th that's, that's a very tricky balance. And I'll give you an example. In Wuhan, in China, where these lockdowns all began, where the, the hardcore enforcement began, twice the number of police officers died than healthcare workers. And you end up in a situation with about 7,000 police officers in total exposed 
um, and at some point either exposed or actually isolated being treated. That's the scale of the risk that they face in China and that's the scale of the risk they face everywhere. Now in balancing out that, that, that real risk to themselves, to their family, someone they, they go home to, it's important for, the, for those, that same logic about operational guidance to be in effect. Individual police officers having to respond to novel situations in real time that they've never encountered for in the context of the health risk that might be associated with it is going to be room for a lot of exposure, lots of risk to them. And it's, 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 it's an area where I think there has to be a more broad conversation, more specific conversation to make sure that um, in terms of things like, in terms of the operational guidelines of the police service, um, detention, arrest, um, and even just, you know, you know, barrier checks and how those things are structured, given the fact that they have operational goals within and are trying to maintain the operational integrity, um, it's important that, that, that there is a broad thinking about making sure that there's some guidelines for them to operate within. Because again, I think leaving it up to the discretion of individual police officers who are operating on extreme duress and who might not also be fully up to abreast with the, the nature of the risk and some of the things that some of the novel realities of the risk as the situation, situation evolves might, be, might, might find themselves exposed in ways that they otherwise would not be if there was a more systemic um, or systems level thinking about the ways to mitigate those individual level risks. Very well. And so I think this is just the time, the right time to bring in um, Suko Shila Kesia Abeye. Shila, so obviously there are challenges and we want to know what kinds of trainings um, went on before your men and women were deployed um, during, you know, uh, when the pandemic started? What kind of trainings did they receive? And I'm saying this because one of the instances was when these Nigerians were arrested and taken to the police station only to be tested and found positive. So exposing all these um, contacts to uh, the risk of contracting COVID-19. What training did they have prior to their deployment? Okay, so Shamima, thank you. What I can say is that, so generally, you know that all police officers go through some kind of basic training. Mm -hmm. During that general training that we all have, you are introduced or exposed to several kinds of operations because every operation must be treated or handled or managed as a, a, a distinct operation for the integrity of that operation. So there are operations where you would have to use the hard police approach, which everybody knows of. And then there are operations where you would have to use the humanitarian democratic soft approach as we did in this kind of operation. So generally, the administration looked at it as a public safety issue regarding health. We looked at how this is an evolving issue. And so the operation was also gonna be evolving. We know how COVID-19 has presented itself with plethora of situations. So we needed to partner with other agencies. So the, or the kind of trainings we gave to our men, which we continue to give because it's not over yet. And we, since um, the partners continue to review or the technical people continue to review, we must also continue to review almost on hourly basis to update our men. So we positioned our men in such a way that they would see this as a partnership, a, a kind of communal partnership. It is a public health and safety approach. We needed, that is why we had to employ the approaches Commissioner spoke about, about the four E's. And even when it came to enforcement, we mm -hmm. still have to look at the protection also for our men. And those were the kind of briefings we gave to our men such that before you even think of arresting a person or before you think of applying any kind of police strategy or approach, think first about the intentment of the enforcement. Mm -hmm. We were enforcing within a legal framework. What was the intentment of the framers of the law? We had heard the president address the whole country and told us about the steps that is being carried or that are being carried out. We heard about the debates in parliament even before the Act 1012 came up and then the consequential executive instruments. So we had been situated or been prepared in such a manner that we knew and we still know that whatever operation we are carrying out related to COVID, 
is right. for the benefit of everyone and it's, it's actually to stop the spread and that is the kind of information or that is the kind of um, approaches and the various theories but, but in that reality is and uh, we, we applaud the work that um, the, the police and other security agencies have done but in reality as you drive um, around there were instances where you saw that um, some of the security personnel were not adequately protected in terms of even their gears. And the example I, I gave to you, if you can address that directly to, so if these briefings went on, how is it that they arrested these people and took them to the police station where you were not yet sure whether or not they, they had the virus? And these were foreigners you had arrested. Mm. I mean know that there have been the typical police arrest procedure where when you take in anybody the first thing the law prescribes you have to do is to take the person to the police station we all know that there were no structures let me say physical structures for taking people who are arrested amidst covid too but now because of the evolving nature of the situation we have been able to say that we did this cell or this police station was this action um, regarding PPEs, we all see the challenge across the globe about PPEs and their inadequacy. And the challenge of also having to be in this kind of uniform and wearing other things. So all these are lessons we have learned along the way, regardless of how well we have handled this. And all these lessons will inform and they continue to inform whatever briefings and trainings and seminars we undergo. Right. So next, um, if you have any, if any of the panelists wants to ask a question of commissioner or you want to say something, you're allowed to say it. But let me also announce that we'll take a few questions um, and contributions, very brief and such things from the participants who have joined us online as well. So whilst I, re I, I take one participant, if any of the panelists want to quickly say something, please feel free now to just jump in and, and, and say. Anyway. Yes, sir. In relation to training, mm -hmm. we all understand that uh, this was just a new kind of thing that no country has been trained for. Even if you train your people for disaster, mm -hmm. nobody will even envisage that you have an invisible enemy. So right. talking about this experience, um, it, it's an experience, and you know, experience yeah. is the best teacher. And mm -hmm. now we are, we, we didn't give our people any training because we didn't see it beforehand. So it's experiential training. So from the Nigerians, we started now testing people who, mm -hmm. that's why we have gotten all these mm -hmm. suspects, positive, and other things from Agenda and other things. Now, as we go along, we have decided to educate for people who test positive. And also, we have our own isolation center for the pol policemen who will test positive. And it's an evolving, evolving situation. Even the scientists don't even now cannot be sure of how the things are, how people are affected. Some say who did, who that. So it's just a matter of police trying to also go along and Try to protect our people from getting infected at the same time, trying to control crime and trying to um, uh, 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 arrest, uh, arrest people who go contrary to the law. But right. let's not forget that when laws are made which are not in consonance with social practice, the people obey the law in deviance. And obviously, people least expect that to be told to. Stay home. People are not used to that in our generation. So it's that's why it's important that we explain the situation to the public. We encourage them to stay home or obey the law in their own interest. And when self interest is at stake, people will voluntarily obey the law. Thank you very much, COP. So we have um, Nana Kofi. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, I, I think that um, Sawate also had his hand raised as well as Nanokofi. But let's take, um, what's his name? Nicholas Opoku, who is one of the participants, um, to ask his question. And then I'll come to you, to my panel members. Nicholas, thank you for joining us. Thank, thanks for having me, Shamima, and good to see you. 
and, and th thanks for the very insightful uh, discussion. So my concerns have to do with, uh, number one, the enforcement of containment measures by the police, and number two, how the police service itself is adjusting its arresting procedure uh, in the wake of, of this pandemic. And that's a point that I, 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 I heard uh, Nana Kofi uh, uh, made, uh, you know, point to. So the first one has to do with you know, reports that we've had and seen of, of police abusing their arresting power uh, with respect to persons who are suspected to have you know, violated the law. What is the police service doing to reduce uh, these instances of police persons who are abusing their arresting power? Uh, number two, recently we, we saw that there was uh, the swearing in of the Akrapim Hine uh, uh, recently. Uh, so subsequently the courts came in to impose some punishment in the form of fines uh, on the chiefs who were involved. But what has happened to the police persons who provided security uh, for the gathering in, in direct violation of the ban on, on, on public gathering? And then also the issue about how the police service also adjusting its arresting procedure. We've had instances where uh, persons in Ashaman who were held in police custody have recently tested positive uh, to the coronavirus. What is the police doing to ensure social distancing uh, as it holds, you know, persons suspected of committing various crimes in, in custody? And what, is, what, 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 what are some of the guidance that the police service itself is providing to its persons to ensure that, you know, they manage themselves uh, uh, looking at how contagious this coronavirus is? Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, COP or Sheila, um, who, who, who would want to take that one? All right. Um, so Nana Kofi asked four questions, I guess. So let me start with the uh, So basically, he asked about what we're doing to police officers who were seen at Tikiapim providing security. Let me clarify mm -hmm. this point here. Prior to what we saw on May Day, there had been a litigation in Tikiapim that we anticipated from intelligence gathered that there could be issues. And so police officers had been assigned to the various factions involved, including even giving security, providing security the day before May Day. Now these police officers that had been assigned were to help or to provide security for the parties they had assigned. On that May Day, these police officers were to direct all the parties they had been assigned to. One of the parties decided that we are going to call libation or we're going to have some traditional um, exercise at the palace. And the police officers knowing very well that they had won, they knew or they interpreted the action to mean that providing them with the necessary security for whatever traditional performances to have gone on. So it is not the case that they were assigned to go and provide security for that particular function. The situation is that police officers had already been assigned to the various factions. And so the police officers we saw, apart from those who were keeping security at the palace, were police officers who were detailed to one of the parties to provide security. And they understood their role, which really is correct at that particular point, to mean providing mm -hmm. the necessary framework or security environment for whatever traditional function to go on, to go on. Several of the people you saw on the cameras were onlookers who had come to, in, in wonder of what is happening. And also in wonder of the public gathering. And so for those police officers, from our investigation so far, we haven't seen what's wrong they have done because they did not go to provide security for that occasion. They had been assigned official duty of keeping security for the factions, and th those are the people we saw. Now, when it comes to you, ask so um, COP will take. We'll talk about the arresting powers in this um, era. But let me talk about the guidance to our old police pe personnel. We have all been made aware of the evolving nature of the virus, such that even scientists and the experts are not able to clearly define the transmission lines, except for some kind of social distancing to be done. This social distancing in view of our normal operations where you don't even send one officer, where officers must be working in groups, where parades are held, briefings are held for parades that involve so many people, 
where troops together have been quite challenging for us and miss the social distancing protocol. And that is why in the, uh, at the beginning, we welcomed the supply of PPEs for the officers who were supposed to be particularly at the lockdown areas. And then we had support of donors in addition to whatever procurement processes the police administration started, which is still ongoing to provide everybody with the necessary apparel for our uniforms. So our police officers have been briefed and sighed such that we know that like every Ghanaian, we must also follow the necessary protocols of not only social distancing, but also following the hygienic protocols of hand washing, the hygienic right. protocols of keeping your sanitizer close by such that frequently- Do they have them? Lying. Have you provided those things for them? To some we have, depending on the duty you're performing. But like I said, particularly when it comes to state supplied masks, the initial ones we got were disposable ones which have been disposed. And then later we had the reusable ones. But procurement processes have already started within the police administration to find suitable masks that will match with the kind of uniform and operations that we have. But so far, every officer has also been psyched to do whatever we have to do to protect ourselves and our families. And the administration has been very supportive in that direction. I am sure I am. when starts talking, he will talk about the fact that there is a committee set up not only at the headquarters level, but in the regional um, uh, commands and also at the divisions and district levels, there are subcommittees and contact officers for managing coronavirus amongst police personnel and our families, such that it is not just about police officers, but it's also about our families, because we need to be able to do well before we can do the work that Ghanaians have given to us to do. Talking about that, COP, before you come in, if you could also address um, the issue about testing the officers who were, you know, deployed to the front line. Um, are the results in, do we know what has happened? If you can address that together with whether or not you have changed your arresting procedures as a result of COVID-19. Commissioner Stacey will take that. Um, yes. You know, as I said earlier, there are two things. How do we enforce and maintain order and at the same time protect the police personnel from getting infected? And it's a dilemma we have to negotiate very carefully and it's a delicate situation. The objective of the whole uh, regulation is to one, limit and stop the importation of the coronavirus, also mm -hmm. continue the spread and also provide adequate care for and it gives the police the power to also enforce social distancing measures designed to keep people apart and also to restrict people from gathering. And this is something that we must do and do well in such a way that police themselves may not get infected. Having said, we have developed protocols and standard operation procedures in enforcing this. That's why, for instance, in Ecopon, looking at the number of people and the number of policemen available, and even if we send reinforcement, how are we going to arrest all these people without getting the police infected? And on the balance of all these things, we decided that, okay, we arrest those who instigated the whole procedure. And that was done, and they were sent to court, and they were fined such a pound. Apart from that, if you look at our statistics, so far, 1,586 people have been arrested. 441 are in the investigation, 703 are on bail, and 227 have been, are in court, and 236 convicted or acquitted. Right. So, for arrest and other things, police are doing really too well. But looking at the situation, which is a novelty, the Inspector General of Police decided that then we have to form a committee, which is the COVID 19 Technical Committee, to also take a look at how the police can work in such a way that we can protect our men. And this committee includes doctors, uh, uh, the, the, the Director of General Welfare, 
and other policemen. And they have been doing a lot of monitoring and uh, um, um, evaluating the situation as okay. it unfolds. So far, the IGP are directed that all policemen should be tested. Mm -hmm. And the headquarters here, everybody has been tested. Now, as I speak with you, there are uh, uh, medical staff in Ashanti region testing everybody. So it has become mandatory for every policeman to be tested. Be we have been, yes, we have been able to um, uh, uh, um, set up our own isolation center. Mm -hmm. Apart from what the government has done, we have set up our own isolation center where people who get infected will go. I must say that one so or in each region. Pardon me. One isolation center or in each region. In, in each region. So okay. But for the start. We have one in Akia region, and IG has directed the COVID-19 committee to identify areas that can be used as isolation center. And right. you know, there's problems too with this isolation center. Nobody would like isolation no, center to be situated no, no. in this or area. And also, talking about PPEs, because this pandemic, this is a global situation, even if you have the money, getting the PPEs is, a, is problematic. And that's why it's gratifying to note that the president said that uh, we are going to produce this PPE locally. And as I'm speaking with now, we have almost ordered 100,000 uh, face masks for all mm -hmm. policemen, which in maybe next week or so we'll get it. So, right. so, and the arresting protocols now have also changed. We have yeah. to check. And even getting the thermometers was a problem. But I think now, we are in the process of getting down for each station. We have Veronica buckets for each station, sanitizers, and everything that they will need. To. And in the greatest, I suppose, use gloves when taking uh, fingerprints and other things. Mm -hmm. And I think individually, individually, it behoves right. of every policeman to also protect himself whilst awaiting for the government supplies or the police supplies. And of course, like I said earlier on, when the laws are not in consonance with social practice, what people are used to, then you need not be so uh, 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 authoritarian in the arrest. That's why it's important to encourage the people to obey the law. It's important for us to explain why it is in their interest to obey the law. And if all these things fail, then we must arrest. And so I think there, there are changes, and like you say, this is the new normal, and the police is also trying to train ourselves to get abreast of the new normal. New normal. Okay, so um, Emmanuel and Nanokofi, you have some very quick interventions to make, and then we'll take a few more participants. Um, let me start with um, Emmanuel first. Yeah, um, um, thank you. Um, so speaking as a criminologist, I, I think that one of the enduring challenges we've had a across the world is the extent to which, depending on the context, the criminal justice system worsens policing or makes it better. So for example, I have in mind the question that the, the participant asked about the person who was arrested and kept in Ashaman. You know, um, across the world, I think Iran released almost close to 120,000 prisoners. America released, I think, Venezuela. For us criminologists, we are waiting eagerly um, to see the impact of how such release might affect law and order. Because sometimes fundamental issues of incarceration, how people are held in remand, um, are usually couched around the fears of the likelihood of those people going back and committing crime. And I think that the current pandemic and all the challenges offers criminologists a very important uh, moment um, to test that theory. The other thing I think um, ACB talked, which is um, very important, um, and I think was reiterated by somebody else, has to do with the arresting, arresting um, and protocols and, and, and the dangers. And I think that once again, it is not only the police who initially made mistakes. I think that we had some doctors and nurses who initially, in the initial phase of, of the disease, were also treating people without the PPE. And so if the police did that initially, I think that we're all on a, on a steep um, learning curve. Last point, 
have to do with an interesting thing. Um, Cambridge is over 800 years. And Cambridge has been closed down only three times. The second time, I think, of the uh, Spanish influenza. And if you go through some of the documents that I have seen around the Spanish influenza and police, it is quite similar, um, or it's not too dissimilar um, from what we are seeing now. The other one has to do with the Second World War, um, where people were made to stay at home in Britain. The difference is that once you have consensus, and I hear that in Ghana a lot when the media is engaging with people, that Butaena, Emma, Mbraiba, and Papa, the law is good. So you have a common enemy that everybody is fighting. The challenge comes when people start capitulating to some of the stress or the strain associated with being at home. And the stress and, and, and the problem people would face, and that is the last point I want to make. And um, the argument is, is presented as though policing is the same across board. No, and I'm sure the police officers know too well that in the rural and the urban centers, the impact of the lockdown, the nature of policing would vary substantially. Even within the urban centers, there is an interesting thing which is said in criminology, that those that the police would arrest are the guilty ones. Those that they, they, they decide not to arrest are the innocent ones. In other ways, you might have problems with thinking that a particular group of people are posing particular challenges to police. But if you drill deep, there are so many factors associated with that. And I think that the variety of policing, the different impacts of the lockdown on different constituencies, are very key in understanding police response and as a criminologist, how it has the impact on crime and violence. Right. Um, Nana, before you come in, let me just read some more questions so that um, all the panel members would have something to respond to Senna, Dr. Kossi, and Professor Kossi Enin. Um, Emmanuel Efa Dennis says, I wish to ask the police reps what steps has been or is being taken to decongest the cells and prisons to protect the inmates from contracting the virus. Also, has the police been able to establish the course of COVID-19 cases reported in a police station, 10 inmates out of 54 source, Joy News, UTV, you say, and what measures have been taken to ensure that inmates are protected from COVID since various preventive protocols are almost impossible to observe. Also, um, this one says, it's obvious that post-COVID, our new normal is to depend on technologies for our everyday activities. It brings to force cybersecurity issues like bombing of webinars, um, et cetera, like as we just experienced in this webinar by a participant called Shannon. It's a breach of privacy. Are laws adequate to address the likely cyber security post COVID? And which areas do we need to immediately reform to ensure that rights and privacy interests are protected? So, um, Nana, you first, then Senna, then um, Sheila. I see your hand is also up. Nana. Sure. So, my, my, my first, yeah, so three things. So, my first thing goes to the comments by Superintendent. Um, Abeya Bachman and COP Kofi Bache. I think it's really reassuring to hear that the police service does have ongoing evolving advisories regarding how to evolve, respond to this thing. Um, and the reason for that is that they are in high contact with the public and there's always the risk that if, if there's not proper protocols within the police service to make sure that A, obviously for their own sake, they can stay safe and for their families, but B, so they don't become a reservoir in terms of their contact with the public for the virus, it's good to hear that they have evolving advisors in place. The second thing I wanted to mention has to do with um, something um, C.O.P. Kofi Bache mentioned with, with respect to the fact that we people are complying in, in, in error. I think that was the terminology. I might be getting it wrong. Um, what, 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 what we are looking at there is people having to respond to aberrations in their normal social lives in terms of the way that they actually comply with, with, with the restrictions. And it's important to keep that in mind, like you said, so that in, 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 in enforcing the laws, that there is some understanding of the fact that we're all coming along together in, 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 in a learning experience. And, and therefore, some of the, the more draconian authoritative approaches may not necessarily be helpful in the long run to actually making sure that the compliance is effective 
and so that like um like dr christine said the eye does not turn to the police as the enforcers rather than um you know just because they're enforcing it now one of the and, and going back to something that um, uh, mr Sorte just mentioned actually um with the matter of the differential you know enforcement of the laws that actually touches on it on an aspect that is really becoming a, a serious conversation in public health of legal epidemiology looking at how the institution of laws and empathy and the enforcement of laws actually create differential outcomes that are not necessarily reflective of of, of just the actual risk of people being in error of the law but of the way people are perceived in terms of their likelihood to, to breach the law and i think that's something that we ought to be very 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 aware of in the enforcement um and especially why you know um again going with something mr Sowati said with regards to um the, the incarceration rates and all that stuff why in thinking about about how we're going to enforce it i'm it, it, it's a little and it makes me a little uneasy to hear more rhetoric about using you know imprisonment and other methods as a means to deter people mm -hmm. because those things in themselves are a not they are counterproductive for you know kind of decongesting de de the, the the prison cells and all those kind of things that have public health imperatives and also because they are unlikely to actually deal with the deterrence effect um if they are not applied universally they only applied in in narrow ways that are you know as perceived as having inherent biases there Right, thanks. Senna, I, I know that one of your um, passion areas is about protecting the police stations themselves. And I think it's emerging from the conversation. That's obviously uh, a source of concern. Yes, I, I mean, I, I, I'm glad to hear that the police is doing quite a lot to protect themselves. But I, like you were saying, I was pretty worried about the police because we have these police stations that are open to any and everybody. And if I have a problem, I just walk to the police station and make a complaint. And this could be a source of the spread of the disease to the police. So, I, I mean, I'm wondering, perhaps I should ask COP, is there some sort of, when you go to the police station to make a report, uh, social distancing um, guidelines in place? Because we just walk to the counter and talk to whichever policeman is there. And I think one way of addressing this is to ensure that in the high risk areas, you know, because I think yesterday there was some information going around about the areas that are high risk in Accra and Ghana now. Perhaps the police should be given PPEs right there, if nothing at all, face masks, like you have when you go to the grocery shops, so that the police are protected from the public because the public go to the police for help. And if the police are not protected, then like, um, Superintendent Sheila was saying, they also get infected and then they go home and then they infect their families. There was a point that Nana Kofi made, which I thought was pretty significant. And that has to do with the fact that there should be in place specific operational guidelines for the police on what to enforce. Because under Act 1012, the president has you know, put in place lots of measures. And so the police have all these rules. Perhaps it will be helpful if specifically it is written down that the police can enforce A, maybe the wearing of masks or no, even though it's, it, it's a guidance, the police are not obliged to ensure that people should you know, forcibly wear their masks because if a policeman is trying to, or a policewoman is trying to get somebody to wear their mask, how would they do it? Are they going to hold the mask over your face? And that also puts them at risk. So I think that perhaps there should be specific guidelines for the police. Fine, there are social distancing rules. You're not supposed to meet, I mean, gather in groups and all that. The, the enforcement of these should not be left at the discretion of the police. Because when we leave that to the discretion of the police, some very enthusiastic and, I don't want to say overzealous, but zealous police officers may want to enforce it and they may end up getting infected. So, mm -hmm. you know, I've read in other places where even though there's a rule about social distances, distancing, it's not the policeman's duty to enforce it. He lets you know, but that's it. He can't force you to do it. And my last point has to do with a question from the viewer who talked about the post-COVID situation where um, cyber communication was very, will be very, will be on the increase. And then he talked about the fact that there's somebody on the forum right now who was doing pretty inappropriate things, putting pretty inappropriate comments. Um, at the moment in Ghana, we have the Electronic Communications Act. 
that sort of guides issues to do with cyber communications and all that. So some time ago, the norm was to do hard copy, but now people are online doing all sorts. And the law has made a provision for that under the Electronic Communications Act, and that can be used to charge people who do illegal things online. So, right. Okay, so um, before I bring uh, uh, COP Boache in to respond to some of the issues, let me ask and um, read a few more questions. Uh, this one from an anonymous attendee says, why doesn't government bring stringent laws that would empower the police better enforce the laws? For instance, Kenya has a law on the wearing of the nose mask. I think this also um, interplays with Senna's point about having strict guidelines on what needs to be enforced and what not. Laws must also be brought to stop citizens from fighting against the sighting of isolation centers in their localities. If everyone fights such acts, where are these isolation sites expected to be in order to fight TOP? Yeah, um, it's important to note that the police cannot enforce what is not law. So if something is not law or it's not an offense, there's no way we can enforce it. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it is also important to note that now, because it's a medical emergency, mm -hmm. many, most people are uh, um, uh, voluntarily um, uh, uh, complying with that. And also, because of the fact that most organizations, institutions, and areas are clearly stated that you cannot enter this place without those mask. Mm -hmm. So invariably, a lot of people are complying. But talking about the police station, um, I think now uh, most policemen are in mask, albeit was not provided by the police. But most of our people are in mask. Most of the CID people are in gloves. But the problem is the police station, like, is a different place. You cannot, somebody can come to the police station and say that because you are not wearing mask, go out. Therefore, going forward, I think um, we will provide much. But why can't you say that? Why can't you tell the person to go out if the person is not adequately protected? What about if somebody is coming to report a crime? He has been brutalized. Mm -hmm. His blood running down his face. Mm -hmm. Can you tell the person to go and wear mask before he comes to the police station? Mm -hmm. But can you tell the person to observe a certain minimum social distance? That will be done. That's why it is, it is, it is, it is, it's, um, it's imperative that as policemen, we get extra marks at the police station to be provided for people who right. visit the police station. But now we have we have been able to secure Veronica Bucket for all almost all police stations. Mm -hmm. Going forward, I think it's, it's it's important that we get extra mass in front of the police stations so that anybody coming to the police stations will be forced to wear masks. Other than that, they will not come to the police stations. Mm -hmm. Also, we have now designated some police staffs in all the regions to take suspected criminals who may not be, because of the type of crime they have committed, cannot be allowed to go on bail. Mm -hmm. So you have specialized police staff who will only take only um, uh, infected people. But by and large, we are discouraging the police from unnecessarily detaining people who may not have committed any serious offense mm -hmm. and can be granted bail to go on bail. And also, we are embarking on the process of decongesting ourselves of all manner of people who may not have committed any serious offense, unless it's a serious felony. Mm -hmm. And now, um, Senna mentioned specific operation procedures, which yeah. I think in this time is very, very important to put down specific operation produce procedures on paper. We shouldn't leave it to the discretion of any police officer to decide how to treat suspects. And the COVID-19 committee is in the process, maybe uh, later by Monday, to send out clear and specific directives on how to treat suspects going forward. But the right. problem, as we all know, 
is to get adequate uh, PPEs for all the police stations. We have more than 900 police stations scattered all over the country. And ideally, we should have thermometers in every police station, although somebody may have low temperature that may still have the virus, especially the asymptomatic people. Mm -hmm. And also, if you test somebody now, how long is the, the results coming to come so that uh, testify whether the person is positive or negative? Mm -hmm. And that is also problematic. So I think uh, until we get this kind of uh, uh, kits which can test people in within 30 minutes, 40 minutes, then it will still be a problem. But like Senna said, we are going to have our own protocols and also the need for every policeman to change his or her style of policing in order not to get infected. Because whether we like it or not, this COVID-19 is going to be with us for a long time. And the time has come for now for us to design our training system, our operational system, in mm. such a way that it will be in consonance with the new normal, as I said. Briefly, Derek wants to um, you know, know if um, the police and military are vested with powers of enforcing the lockdown restrictions. And you also mentioned that you cannot enforce that which is not law, which is tried. But he saw when the lockdown were, was lifted that city guards at the various M MMDAs were punishing people in the marketplaces for defying social distancing measures. They were made to sweep, clean streets, et cetera, et cetera. So what powers did they have to do that, briefly? We have to ask ourselves whether or not they are clothed with those powers. Mm -hmm. You know, because of the lockdown, most of the M M DC, MMCs and other things are uh, promulgating their own laws, uh, albeit to just enforce uh, the directive from the president. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a new situation. And things, like you said, things are evolving. As we go along, things will normalize in terms of what to do and what not to do. But if they are not close to those powers to do what they are doing, then I can say clearly it's illegal. Right. Um, is Professor Enning there? Do you want to come in at this point? I can't, uh, I can't see you. Oh, well, I've been patiently waiting for okay. ages. But let me, <laughs> let me go back. Oh, really? I've raised my hands for ages. Um, oh, both yeah. physically waving and <laughs> using the electricity. You know, I was, I was just about to leave. Is it, is it no um, hey, but Jose. Is it no problem? Bro. Uh, I, I, um, <laughs> I want to go back to managing crowds. I, I, I think somebody mentioned the Equiapim case in particular. Mm -hmm. The Equiapim case is symptomatic of the way that people have behaved across this country, in markets, on the beaches, um, youth resisting the sighting of you know, these uh, centers. And I think there's been a question as to whether the police officers who were on duty had performed as optimally as they could or should. Let me make this clear. And I think Superintendent Sheila said this, or used this particular word, intelligence. Our, the nature of our public policing and the operational and strategic challenges that they face means that whatever assessment those police officers made on the spot showed that they should not respond or seek to arrest anybody. Mm. Let's not forget that the police are perceived as an institution of representing a state that does not deliver public welfare goods. And therefore, had they attempted to arrest anybody, they would have been beaten. So the burning of police stations that Senna talks about is not an isolated case. Right. Actually, both COP and superintendent should be talking about the need to, to provide them with better insurance, for example, were they to lose their lives in the course of duty. Okay, so that is one point that we shouldn't forget. And this is where the skill sets in training in responding to this new problem comes in. 
how do we provide new training protocols and skill sets that allows them to negotiate, to mediate, to calm tensions? Because we know that historically, crowd control is one of the weakest points of the Ghana Police Service. Yeah. So that is one of it. The second is the weaponization of aspects of the COVID-19 that the police officers are going to face. Spittle. We love to spit in this mm. country. Mm. Mm. Okay. And somebody will try to spit saying that I didn't target you. But we are beginning to see across this world the weaponization of spittle as part of the of the angry response. Mm. Okay, to those who are in different uh, professions. Number three is the cyber stuff. The laws on cyber security in this country are like a sieve. It doesn't capture anything, though the rhetoric is fantastic. <laughs> okay, so we are seeing the manner in which, and all of you who have attempted to say something on radio, on television that people don't like, you know, the trolls are out there. Okay, so the usage of the cyberspace mm -hmm. for vigilante activities, mm -hmm. threatening, abusing, intimidating, okay, is going to increase precisely because the physical engagements are going to reduce in the aftermath of this challenge that we are facing. Yeah. COVID-19 poses veritable challenges in, in terms of law enforcement in a broader sense, like Sowati has told us. But all in all, I, I, I think training, targeted capacity building, and COP, please, Anybody who comes carrying $500,000 and saying, I'm coming to do capacity building, it's not all of them that we should accept. Because more often than not, it is more a business venture than the people who are carrying it, who know very little about the issues anyway. Okay, so let's build our own capacity. And this is where I think your point about the operational procedures being developed must bring in people like uh, Justice Tankebi, uh, so I take, and others who can bring in yeah, inputs yeah. so that I there's a collective buy-in into that document so that we all own it. So it becomes our own document and the, the partnership, the support uh, can improve. Mm. So I think you had something to say. Yes. Um, I want to start from where Prof. Enin left off, you know, the evolution of the impact of COVID-19 on, on crime and violence. Across the world, there's been a, a sharp decrease in particular types of crime, if you want to put it in theory, um, crimes that are usually underpinned by rational choice, social control, and things like that. But then there's also the counterpart of it. And that is what Professor Eni was talking about. In terms of sometimes people might get angry and might speak. You know, speak becomes part of the repertoire of their, their ammunition. They are referring to the individuals. When you have stress, sometimes the type of violence that you see, and that is where I want to um, end this, um, at least this um, round of discussion, mm -hmm. that across the world, we are seeing reduction in like street crimes, um, terrorism, um, and other type of crimes associated with um, um, rational choice. But there's an increase in intimate partner violence mm -hmm. and violence against children. Because you see, in certain places in the, um, this part of the world, those who are living in apartments, sometimes the rooms are very small, very, very, very tiny rooms, and you have a lot of people. And so what happens, the, and most of people who live in those small, small um, apartments are people of minority and color. Mm -hmm. And because they cannot stay, sometimes you have five people in a room. When COVID wasn't there, three might work during the day, and two might be there during the night. So you had some room. But during the lockdown, you have a lot of people. And so the psychological stress and the emotional um, challenges of losing jobs and, and staying with somebody for hours that you are not used to, is seen a sharp increase in intimate partner violence. And sometimes people cannot deal with their children because their children will go to school. School is designed mm. to keep children. They are tell children. Me about it. And so you are, you are seeing that the COVID and the response is impacting on crime and violence. And that means something, isn't it? What will be the response, not only of the police, but the other actors that are tied to situations such as this? 
And I think that it is up to us as a country to, to start thinking about you know, the sustainability of the approach now and how we have to vary the approaches. Um, the last one I was going to talk about um, has to do with um, discretion. discretion. At the heart of police is discretion. And I agree with Senna and Commissioner that we have to try and fine tune certain guidelines. But it's an old conundrum. Where do you put the guidelines? Because police is seen as a craft. A craft means that you give people some training, yes, but you also learn on the job on how to adapt the rules and regulations to a vigilance that no law can capture. No law can capture. And, 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 and we don't have time to go into recruitment and training and things like that. But I think that we should think of a country going forward, you know, the sustainability of the approach, the type of crime and violence that we are going to see and how that will um, enhance or undermine um, in our recovery process. Okay, so what, what I would do now is to jump into our conclusion. And so every panel member would have the opportunity to rehash their key points, but uh, specifically also share if it's a call to action that you have, if, if, if a specific um, recommendation that you have, we'll be happy to take it. And COP, when it comes to your tenure and Sheila, if you can also address the issue of the decongestion. There was a question about decongestion as part of your concluding statement. I'll start this round first with Sheila, and then we'll continue. Okay, Sheila. Um, you know, I raised my hand earlier, and I want oh, to address it. Because, yes, you asked a direct question, and then somebody also asked the question of whether we have had any positive cases out of the case. That is not something we want to um, keep under the shelf. You know, we are, we are used to all, all kinds of risks but not the risk of COVID-19. So just like anybody else around the world, we are not immune and we have not been vaccinated. And so um, we have had to record some few cases of positive tests, including even recoveries now as I speak to you. And that is why administration had, had to set up our own management centers managed by the Ghana uh, Police Hospital in coordination with the Ghana Health Service. How many? I, so I am coming to that. The, 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 the issue of privacy has been spoken about by Nana Kuseki, by Professor Kwesieni, by Dr. Dei Tutu, and also by Mr. Sowete. So by all the panelists, about the fact that the, the fact that there have been some imposition of restrictions does not take away all rights, including the right to privacy. Mm -hmm. So because of the stigmatization and because of the evolving nature of the coronavirus disease, what I can assure you now is that we have fewer numbers than we, we even anticipated. Ashley, we are not asking for the names. No, As, I'm not asking I'm, for numbers because the Ghana Health Service has been giving us numbers. No, so. I'm not going to give us the numbers. What I can say is that the number is part of the national statistics that we have whether mm -hmm. in terms of regions or is in terms of the national thing it's still part of it it's not a huge figure in fact and that is very assuring none of our officers i understand showed any symptoms of the mm -hmm. virus disease i understand that for about three officers their second their third test actually have come out negative so they had two negative Test and so they have been asked to go home. And we are still managing all of us, including the psychological aspect of it, nice. so that we will be able to do our work without the fear of contracting the disease. And we've been psyched up sufficiently enough that this is a disease that um, can affect almost everyone. We need to boost our immune system to be able to support it. So that is it about the test. People should not panic. Everything possible is being done by the police administration to ensure that we are safe. And like Professor Kresienin said, I do know that there have been discussions about insurance packages in mm -hmm. such, like such kind of operations at the political levels, or let me say between IGP and the people who have to take care of that. 
And so that is it about that. Now you said that when, uh, as we wrap up, you would also want us to talk about the decongestion thing. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what Commissioner said. Um, sometime in March, which is still something we are carrying out, the instruction came from IGP that no police officer should detain any person for minor offenses, except serious crimes, which need be for suspects to be detained. Mm -hmm. Even in, so even if we had any persons who had been detained for minor offenses, those people were released on police inquiry bill. Mm -hmm. And even for those who had been remanded, steps were taken for the courts to grant them bail on some conditions. Mm -hmm. Now, for serious offenses where we have to detain somebody before we process the person to court, some amount of screening is done through questioning. For police stations that have the temperature gun, they use it. For those that do not have, they adopt the questioning, including asking questions of even witnesses, because we know that not all suspects may be truthful with where they have been and the contacts they have had. And so that is done. All police officers are not expected to touch suspects with their bare hands, mm -hmm. unless it is very, 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 very necessary. All police officers are not, and that comes in with Dr. Deity's guidelines that she said. Guidelines have been developed. They are yet to be printed, but they were shared with operational commanders to be part of the regular briefings. You know, police officers, we have daily briefings and actually briefings after duties. So those guidelines, which also continue, uh, could, uh, reviewed almost on a daily basis, are shared with operational commanders for the briefing of the men. And um, as Ms. Um, Commissioner said, they will be printed for every police officer because they keep changing, certain things keep changing. And so that is why the commanders need to have them on daily basis. But when it comes to the police officers, they will have printed copies in their pockets as we go on. So mm -hmm. these are some of the decongestion exercises. You know about the disinfection we do regularly. We, have, we started these disinfection exercises from March. Fortunately, government has also come in and so Zoom Lion is even partnering us in addition to our internal efforts of providing knapsack sprayers to every police division and right. this plans for the disinfection. And mm -hmm. so that disinfection exercise will carry on until perhaps um, we know that the situation is okay. Now, okay. and then we have I also have, um, Commissioner has spoken about the dedicated cells in the various regions for suspects related to coronavirus diseases. For suspects who were arrested and who we continue to arrest on the basis of suspicion, including having the disease, the instruction is that we are not supposed to keep them in the cells, but take them to the Ghana Health Service um, centers, identify centers within the districts, within the divisions, within the regions such that they should not be contained in the cell. So when they are taken to this Ghana Health Service facility, through the partnership and the joint effort, they are tested and then later we get to know the identity. The, 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 the good news is that our officers who tested positive, not all of them can be traced to arrest. Right. In fact, there are two officers who have recovered who got infected through contact tracing on a bus. So mm -hmm. somebody was um, tested positive and then the person shared the people who were with him on the bus and it turned out to be, so even at the first point of test, it came out negative, but he was encouraged to self-isolate and then later, if, and that person has recovered. We also have a, a police officer who tested positive as a result of coming into contact with a positive case at her house or in her home. So not all of the police officers who have had to test positive right. situations related to arrest or normal police operations. And so Thank you, Sheila. Let me go to Senna. Senna, so what might be your key takeaways and any you know, point for further action? Okay, um, I would say that I just have two, two main things to say. I'd like to commend the Ghana Police Force. I think that they have been doing an excellent job. I'm proud of them. You know, you hear all these horror stories about police in other countries, and, and then, you know, we're talking to them, oh, but in Ghana, our police are doing great. Of course, they are the exceptional ones, but generally, I think that 
they're doing great. They should continue with the engagement, the explanation, the encouragement, and then enforcement as the last resort. I also think that the government has a duty to ensure, in the same way we're going on and on about the, the nurses and the doctors who are on the ground working, I think that the government has a duty to also ensure that the police who are maintaining law and order, without which we can't have the country like we do now, should also be added to the frontline workers. So when we're talking about PPEs and other protective equipment, the police should be considered, in my opinion, the same level as the doctors and the nurses, because they are the ones who, you know, who are in the society getting things going. And I think another thing that the police should look at is the welfare of the police. You know, a few people have talked about insurance and then the police say this a lot, boosting of morale, you know? <laughs> because apart from the fact that they're doing their regular policing, you know, arresting people, regular crime is still going on, it hasn't stopped. Now they've added this aspect to the jobs that they're doing. So I think that it is necessary that their morale is boosted I saw something the other day, it was on CT, someone sent it to me that I think some um, immigration officers had turned down bribes to some oh. people who tried to enter the country and then they were promoted, which is a good thing, right? Because then it says as an incentive to do right. And another thing I also think we should concentrate more on will be about the community policing. Like we've all said, at the end of COVID-19, whenever that is, policing like we know it would have changed and for more effective, you know, police civilian engagement, we need to get the police more in our communities, work with us more, and it will make them even more effective than they are now. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's a lot to say. Um, let me bring in Nana Kofi, whilst you are at it, also the, the issue of mental health. I think so what has alluded to it but it's a conversation that must be, be had. Mental health of the frontline workers, the police, the health you know, sector, and even citizens who have had to go through these isolations and the quarantine and what have you. What, what, what would be your concluding remarks? Let me start with the mental health aspect there. That, that is one of the areas that I, I, I really do think we need to pay much closer attention to that has to do with stress, which we know in public health is not just a question of people's inability to cope. It's a question of how they embody physiologically the difficulties and experiences they are, they are having and what that means for their long-term health. We, you, like like, like uh, Emmanuel said, we know that things like domestic abuse are on the rise and those things reflect fundamental responses to stress. But there's also the actual you know, metabolic responses people are gonna have more intense, intensity of their chronic conditions and other things like that, that we really ought to pay some close attention to. And when it comes to frontline workers from the police service, the clinical staff and, and, and all the people everywhere um, you know, working this response, they are, they are the ones who have to live with not just the individual separated risk of, 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 of getting, of, 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 you know, of minimizing the, their, their experience, the struggle, but also dealing fundamentally with the fact that their families are at risk and the, 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 the stress of trying to manage those things. So direct, you know, intentional support, especially to the frontliners, both the police and the healthcare workers, I think is, is an absolute imperative at the moment. Um, to, to wrap up my, 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 my thoughts on the issue, I said a couple of weeks ago in an interview that I thought that what, sure, COVID-19 fundamentally is a test of every nation's character and our commitment to be able to focus to a singular issue. Um, that, that requires all actors to act to, to perform their duties effectively. You cannot expect the police service to be effective at doing what they're doing if other actors that are responsible for health education do not su succeed in their efforts. We cannot expect the police service to be successful in operational management of their risk if other actors who are responsible for making sure they can do perhaps rapid testing and other quick case identification do not do their bit. And if we, if we leave that entire bed onto a police service, then we risk making them the fall guys for a much larger systemic failure. Um, not to say that systemic failure is happening, but that if it, that if it should happen, the police service as the enforcers end up being um, tagged with, with those failings. So it's important that as a collective systemic action, um, we, we make sure that they are actually enabled and empowered to succeed in the enforcement uh, role that they're given in this public health crisis. 
Thank you very much, um, Nana Kofi Kwachi. Imano and yes, um, your concluding um, remarks will be? Yes, um, the, I'm always speaking like a criminologist. Um, we as criminologists are interested in, in, in crime and violence and, and how COVID-19 will impact on crime and violence. I mean, there are huge variations across geographical spaces. There are huge variations across gender profession. Um, and I think that so far, repeating myself, I don't see police and most of us of a particular orientation would do as law enforcement, but within cleaning, let me give him the credit, um, see it as social peacekeeping. If we see the enforcement as just a small, about 20% components of police work, because there was a question you asked about arrest. If police will enforce every law, there's nowhere they can keep even the suspects or those who are convicted, no country can. So the issue of adaptability, the issue of how you use police as a craft, working in synchronicity with other actors, is going right. to be very key. And let me conclude on this um, point. When you follow, any, any student listening can write a TV on that. The president's speech, this is about the seventh. When you study the text, you realize that the approach and the response have, um, the approach and the responses have been evolving. So initially he talked about stay at home and um, he talked about how you can bring back economy, you can bring back life. Mm -hmm. And then at a point he emphasized the fact that social media was being used to demoralize the police. The last one I heard was telling us that our immunity is important and that people should eat particular nutrients. That that one, that one. And so you realize that even the president's speech in itself is there is for me an epidemic of how the state is responding from that perspective. And it shows how multidimensional the approach should be. And I think that if we look at the multidimensional aspect, we'll see that the police repeating myself is just one. And as I had said earlier on, the performance effectiveness of the police is contingent on other actors, but we have to also be fair that the police themselves, the organization and the community. Last thing, we are all like middle class, highly educated, those on the panel. It will also be good to have you know, those in the lower echelons of society um, who do not have the networks we have, the exposures we have, and let's see their assessment of, of, of the response of the state and individual. Right. I think that would be very good. Right. Oliver, over to you. Maybe in one of the sessions, you would, you would consider that. Um, Professor Enin. Yes, thank so, you very much. Thank you. So let me say a couple of things very briefly. First is that when COVID came, Ghana as a country in terms of our levels of preparedness for epidemics and pandemics was extremely low. We were 105 or fifth country out of 195 countries. Oh, wow. COVID has also shown us something very fascinating. The willingness of the police and the military to collaborate in assistance to civil authority. So the president first describes the virus as the enemy and then gives muscle both to the army and the police to protect the state. Now the president, his ministers, and quite a number of people that so are to cause the elites have presented a narrative to the public that has sought to provide information, but also to explain the threats posed to Ghana as a whole. Then there is a general, you know, fairly open acceptance by the public about this narrative tinged with fear, uncertainty, angst, as the virus is presented legitimately as an existential threat. This acceptance of this threat then leads to the presentation of a fiat for extraordinary measures, police, military collaboration, face masks, social distancing, lockdowns, closure of markets. Mm -hmm. Now, what do all these tell us mm -hmm. relating to a country that has resource constraints? First, that because we are talking about policing, that the directives from the Ghana Police Service to the public have been clear and non-conflictual. If you compare right. this to the Ministry of Tourism and this 
uh, authority two days ago, they came with totally divergent messages. Two, the police service has managed an existential crisis in a manner that has resulted in keeping communities that previously were hostile on its side, keeping them secure and engaged. COVID-19 has been a major plus for police community relations. Two final points. Before the service has appointed an overall national coordinator, that I think our, our colleague have said, that deals with the security aspects, but also the, and, and also the, the, no, the non-health aspects and also the health aspects. They've learned to engage better with the media and use a language that everybody understands. Final, two final, final points. One relates to what I called earlier, hybrid forms of security, peace, and justice provision. Collaborating with local sources of authority, power, and knowledge at the community level that Suwate is talking about is critical to building strategic alliances and passing on important messages. Last point, we can't do this alone. Multilateralism and international cooperation is critical to building consensus to respond to the crisis in a more effective manner through securitization of the risk and the threats involved. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Prof. And so we'll give, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, the final um, wrapping up comments to uh, COP Kofi Bwachi. So you've heard um, from the other panel members, what will be your key takeaway? What should we be expecting to see of, of the police moving forward in dealing with the pandemic and most importantly, beyond the pandemic? The key word is adaptation. We, both the public and the police must adapt to the new normal. So the please power your voice more. I'm saying that the key word now is adaptation. We adaptation. All, yes, we must all adapt to the new normal. The situation is fluid, dynamic, unpredictable, and we are all in uncharted terrain. It's unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it behoves on all of us to day by day change our attitude to suit the new normal. And it's not a new normal that if you fail, you will live. It's a deadly new normal. Having said that, the assurance is that the police is going to do its best to solve the dilemma between crime control and due process to solve the dilemma of how we can maintain law and order, uphold human rights, and at the same time, keep the public safe. Because don't forget, criminals take advantage of such situations to also commit crime. There are people, and most criminals, don't even fear the virus. What they fear, what is how we can arrest them. Therefore, the police service in performing its normal duty will adapt its procedures and strategies to suit the situation that we are in. One, we will do our ultimate best to protect the people from crime. Two, we must know that on balance of probabilities, the police will, stay, will work for the majority instead of the minority. So any group of people who would try to just go beyond what is expected and not go by the new regulation, the police will deal with them according to, accordingly, based on our new protocol. And also to the policemen, the police administration will do its ultimate best to provide the PPEs and also see to it that new procedures and protocols are put in place in order to keep them safe. Having said that, I think um, it behoves on all of us to know that police is a shared responsibility and police cannot do it alone. We need your support, we need your cooperation, we need your collaboration in order to succeed and defeat this invisible enemy, which is catching the whole world. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. If you all unmute your mics, I think that. We all deserve a big round of applause. 
Everybody, let's give ourselves a round of applause. We can do it virtually, you know. It's not normal time, so we must take you with, with what we have, with what, you know, technology offers us. And so that was COP Kofi Boache, who is uh, the commissioner in charge of research, planning, and m and &E at the Ghana Police Service. You also had superintendent of police, Ms. Sheila Kessie Abaye Bachman, who is the director of public affairs of the service as well. Other panel members have been Nana Kofi Kwachi, a PhD Hi. candidate at the New York University College of Global Health, as well as Emmanuel Soate, who's also a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge and a former senior peace and development advisor at UNDP. We also were glad to be joined by Dr. Sena Ifwa Day Tutu, who is a lecturer at the University of Ghana School of Law, as well as Professor Chrissy Enin, who is a director of the Faculty of Academic Affairs and Research at the Kofi Annan International Peace Keeping Training Center. We thank you all so very much. And that is how we end our session, which was on policing and the COVID. 20, uh, COVID-19, COVID-19, they say. We asked the question whether the police was struggling, coping, or somewhere in between. And I think the consensus has been that the police is coping, albeit there are challenges that need to be addressed, including resourcing the police to protect themselves in order that they can protect us. We thank you all the participants who joined us um, online as well as um, everybody else who's been part of the process. It has definitely been engaging and I pray you found it good use of your time. Special appreciation to our panel members, to the University of Ghana School of Law and all who work behind the scene, Oliver and his team to bring us this successful seminar. And special thanks to my little people who um, have been of their best quiet behavior in a long while and long while at home here with me, allowing me to complete this task uninterrupted. The next series will be on international arbitration, business and commercial contracting in the face of COVID-19. And it will be on 21st of May, same time, 1 p.m. Do make a date. Until next time, bye for now. My name is Shamima Muslim. Yay, we